All right, I'm always forgetful on that. So I'm not gonna repeat everything that I said, but basically we're talking about Rosh Hashanah night, we come home, uh, the tables should be set. Uh, guys and gals, whoever you are, we, there's no reason one party does it the other. Uh, we do cooperation. Uh, but traditionally, the candles are lit before the onset of the holiday. So just like on Shabbat, 18 minutes before sunset, we should light the candles. If someone's going to the synagogue, they can light the candles before they go to the synagogue. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, if you don't go to the synagogue, light the candles then. Uh, the blessing, uh, as we'll go over all the brachot eventually, but every blessing begins with the same formula. Baruch Atah Adonai Elohim Melech Olam, praise to you, Lord God, King of the Universe. When we're about to perform a mitzvah, we then have added words that suggest we're going to do the mitzvah. Asher Kiddushanu Mitzvotav, who has sanctified us by his commandments, Vitzivanu, and commanded us. And then we plug in what the mitzvah is. And Lakat Neirot for Shabbat, Lahadlik Neir Shel Shabbat, on Yom Tov, Lahadlik Neir Shel Yom Tov. It's in the Sidurim, it's in Machsarim. Eventually, I will give you both the Hebrew and the transliteration thereof. Uh, and uh, some, some say the Shechianu when they light the candles, otherwise, they wait till the Kiddush. Now, again, as on Shabbat evening and during the course of all the holidays, traditionally, we have two whole loaves of bread on the table. Uh, if it's Friday night, often people have the twisted challahs. You don't have to, but uh, that's one tradition. They're on the table. They're covered with a cloth. We take a cup of wine. Uh, Friday night, we're other things that we do, uh, but we'll talk about that more later. Uh, and then we recite the Kiddush. There's a special Kiddush for Shabbat. There's a special Kiddush for uh, the holidays. Once again, you look into the Machsarim or the Sidurim, what you have available to you. Uh, hopefully, they have something for you. Um, for Shabbat, we'll be talking about the Sabbath. And on Yom Tov, it'll talk about the Yom Tov that we're celebrating. And then traditionally, before we eat bread, one is supposed to wash one's hands. A lot of this I'm going to go back over in more detail when we talk about Shabbat. Uh, we wash the hands. Uh, and uh, whoops, sorry about that. I was just, okay, sorry, close chat. Close, okay. Uh, we wash, traditionally, we wash our hands. Uh, we come to the table. Let's talk about Rosh Hashanah. Uh, as I say, we have two loaves of bread. Traditionally, on Rosh Hashanah, the bread is made in a circle rather than the traditional just braided straight long piece of bread. Uh, usually it's done in a circle, a round challah uh, to represent the cycle of the year. And true in many cultures, the idea that the, the roundness represents repetition uh, through the course of the year. Uh, now, one special thing on Rosh Hashanah and also on Sukkot, many have that tradition, is that instead of putting salt on the, the challah or dipping the challah into salt, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, on uh, Yom Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot, we dip it in honey or we put honey on the bread. After we, we eat some of that bread with the honey, traditionally we say a uh, formula in Hebrew that God should make this year as sweet. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on my words tonight. Okay. Then some people have a tradition of eating different special foods on, on the first night of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, that is not my normal practice. But what we do is we do have an apple and we uh, again put honey on it. We say the blessing for the fruit of the tree because we're eating the, this piece of apple as a special addition to the meal. So it's not covered by the hamotzi. Uh, and uh, once again, we, we put the honey on that piece of apple. 
uh, we eat, take a bite and eat or eat the slice. And then again, we say the formula, will be for you. May this year be a sweet uh, and good year. Now, obviously, the, the symbolism is very much apparent in the, in the actions here. And you have a nice meal. Um, my wife's been fretting over it already for a couple of weeks. She's, she, you know, uh, today is Wednesday. You know, Friday night is almost done already, you know, more or less. No, not quite. But though, that's how she is. But we have a nice festive meal that evening. Um, now, in the morning, in the synagogue service, I, I, I addressed this a little bit before, uh, is much elongated compared to normally on Shabbat. Uh, the basic core of the service is the same. We have preliminary blessings. We have recitation of passages from the book of Psalms. We then have um, two ble the uh, Baruch Hu, the summoning to prayer. We have two blessings that precede the recitation of the Shema. And after the Shema, we have another blessing. And then we go into the Amidah, the silent prayer. Uh, similar to Shabbat. Uh, what is different uh, on uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is because the day became extremely important in the minds of Jews, the idea of judgment, of repentance, and all of this kind of thing. Uh, therefore, a lot of liturgical poems were written and added to the service. Uh, 400 years, 500 years ago, before the, you know, the print, printing press and all that was very current, um, many communities had their own PU team, as they referred to. Uh, and they were not necessarily the same liturgical poetry that was said in another town. With the coming of the printing press, the printers wanted to sell their machsarim. So how do you sell a machsar? Well, you make sure that you have as many PU team in it for the different communities that you want to sell it to. So uh, a lot of PU team then became collected in the Mahsar. Many then became standardized for everyone. Not all of them were recited everywhere. Some were omitted. Some were truncated. I'll talk about one of those later on. Uh, and different communities have different practices uh, the traditional machsor will ha often have a large number of pew team and every synagogue either does all or part or whatever they do in terms of the pew team and also depend on the nature of the machsor that they have. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the important elements after, the, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead too fast. Uh, we have a Torah reading. Uh, each day of Rosh Hashanah, we have a Torah reading as we do every holiday, every Shabbat. Interestingly enough, uh, the first day's reading has nothing to do with the creation of the world. You might have thought, since Rosh Hashanah is, uh, as it described in the Machsar, Hayom Harat Alam, the world was created today, you might have thought we would read the passage from Genesis about creation. But instead, we read a passage from which says uh, about the naming of the fact of naming, the fact of the birth of Isaac. The Torah says that God visits Abraham and, uh, and Sarah and tells them they're going to have a child. Sarah laughs. They're saying, look, I'm an old lady already and my husband's an old man, but God doesn't tell Abraham that Sarah said he was an old man. Uh, but uh, he promises them a child. And the Torah reading that we open up with is Amar. God remembered Sarah as he had said. Thus, this theme of remembrance, and we'll come back to remembrance in the uh, service of the holiday in a bit. Um, now, we read that story, we read a, a difficult story that talks about how Hagar. Uh, was pushed out of the family, out of the camp with Ishmael, her, uh, her son. Uh, another time we can go into more depth on it when we uh, look at the Torah. Um, but uh, we then also, as we always do on holidays and on, uh, 
Shabbat, we have a reading from the prophets, from one of the books of the prophets, many times from Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they're the most often uh, used, but from various uh, uh, portions, as well as the earlier portions. And indeed, what we read on the first day of Rosh Hashanah is the story of Hannah. Hannah was the mother of Samuel, Shmuel, who was one of the prophets, uh, one of the last of the judges. There are two books in the Bible, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, taken after his name. And again, we have a theme that reappears throughout the Tanakh, throughout the Jewish Bible, of difficulty of the birth of a heroic figure. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, I do not have a child for a long time, they're barren. Isaac and Rebecca don't have a child for a long time, they're barren, uh, before the birth of, of Esau and Jacob. Uh, Rachel, the favorite wife of Jacob, doesn't have a child for a long time. And here too, we read about uh, Hannah, or Hannah, who also doesn't have a child. And what's significant, there are two things, well, I think, why that passage is recited on Rosh Hashanah. One, it parallels the, the storytelling of the birth of Isaac. Hannah asks for a child and God gives her a child. Secondly, there's a wonderful scene in which Hannah goes to uh, Shiloh, that's where the uh, tabernacle was located in those days. And she prays to God and uh, Eli, Eli, who is the shofet at that time, the high priest sees her praying, doesn't realize she's praying, uh, thinks she's just drunk. And so she says, no, uh, I am indeed praying, pouring out my soul to God. And the rabbis use, based upon that story, to define how prayer should be. And certain elements that they say, and what she was doing, she was silent except for her own ears. Nobody else could hear but her. So too, when we pray, we're supposed to be allowed enough for ourselves, our own ears to hear our prayers, but not necessarily anyone else. Uh, and it goes through some other things that they based upon that. So it serves a significant uh, aspect of the story. Uh, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we read the story of the binding of Isaac. How God tells Abraham to take his son, and to offer him up as an olah, as a burnt offering on Har Moriah, which Avraham does. It's a very difficult story. Uh, we're not, again, we're not going to go in great depth on it to here, but the two main figures are Abraham and Sarah, and Yitzchak, who goes with him to be offered as a sacrifice. And there's a very famous uh, pas passage there in which uh, Abraham, Abraham and Yitzchak Isaac are walking together up to the mountain. And uh, Abraham is carrying either flint stone or, or a fire that's kept going. Uh, and he has a knife. And Isaac has got a bunch of wood on his back. Uh, and Isaac says, oh, here's, the, here's the, the fire and the wood. Where is the sacrifice? And, God, and Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide the sacrifice, my son. Now you can put the comma in there, and God will provide the sacrifice, my son, speaking to my son, or as one of the commentaries suggests, Avram was telling Yitzhak, my son is the sacrifice. And yet Yitzhak willingly goes along. And uh, the story of the binding of Isaac, especially in the Middle Ages, in uh, Christian lands, uh, was a story that uh, many of the Ashkenazi Jews look to uh, as the, a model for being prepared to give up your life rather than leave, uh, uh, leave Judaism, for uh, being a martyr to, to Judaism. Okay. Now, after the Torah reading of both days of Rosh Hashanah, except when Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, just like during the month of Elul, as we mentioned last week, we blow the shofar every morning. So on Rosh Hashanah, both days, we blow the shofar, except on Shabbat. The rabbis, uh, for various reasons given in the Talmud, suggest there might be a problem of blowing the shofar on Shabbat, and so they forbade it, and we follow that tradition today. 
The shofar is a ram's horn. Now I'm going to try and do some screen sharing again. Uh, okay, uh, all right. Here are two pictures of two different kinds of shofarot. They are not uh, of appropriate size compared to each other. All right, this one here is much smaller than this one here. This is more found in Ashkenazic circles, a ram's horn. Uh, it's, the ram horn is cut here and the mouthpiece is cut here. It's hollowed out. Actually, it's got a kind of, uh, uh, it's not bony inside. It's a different kind of material. The, we boil it, you take it out. And this is from a different kind of, of sheep, uh, an antelope of, of some kind. Uh, and that's associated especially with the Sephardic communities. Uh, and now the shofar is sounded in a particular way. All right, let's see, we'll share this. Rather than you having to listen to me, I thought I would use this and let us see if it works. It's pretty good. All right, I just. All right, so now the way it is, you know, they kind of uh, just uh, did a, a this smaller version of what takes place. Uh, the tradition has developed that the chauffeur is blown a hundred blasts during the course of the day. Uh, and uh, it's done in a series. Uh, the person calling out will, will call out the name of the sound they're supposed to make, tekiah, which is one long blast. Uh, shvarim trua, shvarim is three shorter blasts. And then the trua, which is supposed to be nine blasts. Okay. I'm gonna bring one of my dogs here and stick him on the screen too, if you don't watch out. Actually, one of my dogs barks at the dogs on the TV, so we gotta watch out for that. Okay, um, is he gonna take the test? She, he, okay. <laughs> um, there's a mock, uh, mock look, a discussion, a dis disagreement in the Talmud as to what the middle sound is supposed to be. Is it three short blasts or is it nine shorter blasts? So of course, the Jewish waves do both. So we do three times kia, shvarim tura to kia, do that three times. Then kia shvarim to kia, the kia with the three shorter blasts three times. And then kia trua, the kia with the nine short, shortest of blasts, followed by kia. We do that three times. And the last one is the longer blast of kia gadola. And so that adds up to, to uh, 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 30 blasts of the shofar, if, right? Uh, and then uh, during the repetition of the midah, most uh, the tradition in most Ashkenazic communities had been uh, during uh, certain sections, which we'll talk about in a little while, of the Musaf Amidah. At the end of those sections, one would blow the shofar uh, the ten, 10 times. Uh, thus giving you uh, the, the 30 blasts there. So you now you got 60 and you would do 30 at the end of the service and then an extra 10 at the very end. Uh, one of the traditions that are, is often found today in a lot of conservative synagogues but has its origins in the Sephardic world 
uh, but even the Talmud speaks of it, is saying during the silent Amidah, when we come to those same sections to sound the shofar as well. Uh, and that way the shofar blower has a little bit easier time of blowing the shofar uh, rather than doing all so many at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very important element of the service and obviously it's very unique. In the synagogue today, in the traditional synagogue, we do not use musical instruments. We know musical instruments were used in the ancient temple uh, and it was thought to be perfectly legitimate. Uh, but after the destruction of the temple, the rabbis decreed that we would not uh, sound the shofar, uh, blow, oh, excuse me, play musical instruments in the temple uh, as they had done before. And that was uh, based upon the idea they were afraid that if something happened, especially to a stringed instrument, that they might repair it. And therefore, that would be a violation of doing a work on Shabbat, constructive labor on the Shabbat. Right. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. I just had a question about the uh, the uh, the horn. Yeah. The yeah. So, what is the purpose of it? Like, what is it? Just like back in the day, what was it used for originally? Well, we read. In the, in the, actually, in the, Torah, the Torah itself says about sounding the horn. It doesn't really quite specify exactly what it is, but rabbis understood it to mean a ram's horn of some kind. Uh, and um, it was the major uh, alarm. If you were, you know, the enemy's at the, at the walls, you blow the shofar to gather everybody together. If there's some kind of a danger, they would sound the shofar to summon people to take care of it. The Talmud talks about if a ship is floundering by, this, uh, uh, by the port. Uh, Maimonides says it's like an old, you know, he doesn't use the term alarm clock, but we would. It says, wake up. Wake up and recognize what you've done wrong. Uh, now, a, a uh, anthropologist of a religion might also point out that in many cultures, using horns or making sounds had a kind of a magical quality to it, to scare away demons. Uh, uh, and we still have remnants of that. What happens on the secular New Year's Eve at midnight? People blow horns, they make noises, sound, right? Those are all related, but in Jewish tradition it now becomes not uh, to scare away demons or anything, but it is meant as a reminder to repent, to think about your behavior, to try and do better uh, at this time of year. And so, you know, and, and really, since it's so unusual in the synagogue, at least in traditional synagogues, to have any kind of music at, at all, it certainly serves a very strong uh, symbolic uh, action that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, okay. And that's fine. Like whenever you've got a question, if I don't see you wave your hand, because there are a lot of boxes, little boxes here, just shout it out now. I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Okay. Um, now, the service uh, uh, normally uh, on uh, the Sabbath or on any other of the holidays. When we have what we call the Amidah, the silent prayer, the standing prayer, there are three brachot, three blessings at the beginning, three blessings at the end that are recited at every service, no matter what, day of the week, Mincha, Marav, Shachri, the morning service, the evening service, afternoon service, those three blessings are always the same. On a weekday, we have 13 other blessings, uh, which are basically requests, thanking God for giving us knowledge, giving us health, to watch over us, to heal us, uh, various kinds of requests. That was considered to be inappropriate on the holidays. 
And so in, instead of the middle 13 pen, uh, uh, petitionary prayers, on Shabbat, even Yom Kippur, on Sukkot, Shavuot, Pesach, we have just one prayer, one blessing in the middle. On Rosh Hashanah, we actually have, we have three blessings in the middle. And they are all uh, based upon uh, the Talmud's idea of what we're supposed to be recognizing today. The first section is called the Malchiot, talks about the kingship of God. God is king. You know, the, the, the king was the final judge uh, of everyone. And so God is the final judge. And so that fits in with that way, in that manner. Uh, and uh, so we uh, bless God. All right. Then we have the second section, which is called Zichronot, remembrance, because in this case, we want God to remember us, remember us for good, uh, not to uh, cause harm to come to us. Just like the previous section, it is built upon various verses taken from the three different parts of the Bible, verses from the Torah, verses from the prophets, verses from the writings. Uh, and uh, again, we uh, recite the bracha at the end of that, uh, marking uh, the end of that part of the service. And then uh, finally, we have Zichronot. Uh, I'm sorry, I said Zichronot and uh, I left out Shofarot. Okay. And, one, and the section of Shofarot, which talks about the sounding of the Shofar, both in the past and in the future. Okay. I just want to look at something here. And so those three sections, Malchiot, Zichronot, Shofarot, serve as the dividing parts of the Amidah. Uh, and the bulk of those passages are, as I said, uh, verses taken from the Torah, from the writings, and, and from the prophets. But uh, the uh, Service, as I mentioned before, has a, a lot of additional PU team, additional liturgical pieces that uh, were composed specifically for the holidays. Some of them are both on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur. Uh, and uh, some of them entered into the regular daily service, as a matter of fact, the Alena, which was a prayer that was originally composed for recitation uh, during the Amidah of Rosh Hashanah, uh, eventually became uh, part and parcel of uh, every service that we say at the end of the service. Now, amongst those, are words that talk about the day of judgment, Yom Hadin. Uh, Yom Truah, the day of sounding of the shofar, is what we recite on uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. But uh, the idea that we stand in judgment, and there's a, a prayer, a very powerful one, uh, that is known as Matana Tokef. Let's see. Yeah. Too big. That's a little too big. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. Now, there's an interesting uh, story, first of all, behind uh, this prayer, the Antana Tokef. Uh, according to legend, there was a rabbi uh, who was uh, kept being summoned by the local bishop, this is in the Middle Ages, to uh, convert to Christianity. And every time that he was asked to do that, he refused. However, one time, instead of saying no right away, he says, give me three days to think about it. And of course, as soon as he, he walked off, walked out of there, he realized that he made a serious mistake. Uh, and so he spent the days fasting and praying to God. Finally, the day came in which uh, he was summoned to the bishop. He didn't want to come to see him. So he was dragged there. And uh, uh, the, the, the churchman said, what should be done to you as a punishment because you didn't come? And he says, well, this my tongue, which said I would consider it that should be punished, take, means taken away from me. He says, no, it's not your tongue that is fault, but your legs, your limbs for not bringing you here. And so according to this legend, he was, his arms and legs were amputated. He was left in, in a basket. It was just before the Yomim Noraim. He was at, he asked that he be brought to the synagogue. Uh, and when it came to the Kedusha portion of the Amidah, he recited this poem this piwot, and then promptly died. And one of, uh, an angel visited one of the rabbis later on and gave him the words for this piwot uh, to be recited. So that's the legend behind it. Uh, if you're interested in researching it for, for a more scholarly, less legendary uh, aspect to it, uh, there is very clearly some parallels between this and a Christian uh, hymn. Uh, which comes first is open to question, uh, but it, they are kind of opposing each other in certain ways. Right? But anyway, so let's look at uh, this, this poem that is called Hebrew Natana Tokif. All right? So it opens up, so now the Kedusha prayer shall ascend to you, for you, our God, our King. So then both the congregation and the Chazan, the Shliyaf Sibur, the cantor, are, are recited first the congregation tradition recites it quietly silently and then the chazan says it out loud and so this translation that i have here is let us now relate the power of this day's holiness for it is awesome and frightening on it your kingship uh will be exalted your throne will be firmed with kindness and you will sit upon it in truth. It is true that you alone are the one who judges, proves, knows, and bears witness, who writes and seals, who remembers all that is forgotten. You will open the book of Chronicles. It will read itself, and everyone's signature is in it. In another translation is everybody writes it for themselves in it. The great shofar will be sounded, and a still thin sound will be heard. Angels will hasten a trembling and terror will seize them and they will say, behold, it is the day of judgment to muster the heavenly host for judgment for they cannot be vindicated in your eyes in judgment or they're not innocent in your eyes in judgment. Even the angels in heaven, according to the poet, are judged this day. Okay. So after the congregation recites that passage, then the Chazan and then the Chazan goes on to, to read the next part. All humanity will pass before you like members of the flock, like a shepherd pasturing his flock, making sheep pass under his staff. So shall you cause to pass, count, calculate, and consider the soul of all the living. And you shall apportion the fixed needs of all your creatures and inscribe their verdict. And so here comes where uh, often it's, it's musically very, very much emphasized. On Rosh Hashanah, it will be inscribed, and on Yom Kippur, it will be sealed. 
ראש השנה יקטבו וביום צום כיפור, יום צום כיפור And sometimes the Chazanim will do that for a long time. And when you sit down already, but it's still going. All right. So how many will pass from the earth? How many will be created? Who will live? Who will die? Who will die at his predestined time? And who before his time? Who by water and who by fire? Who by sword? Who by beast? Who by famine? Who by thirst? Who by storm? Who by plague? Who by strangulation and who by stoning? Who will rest and who will wander? Who will live in harmony and who will be harried? Who will enjoy tranquility and who will suffer? Who will be impoverished and who will be enriched? Who will be degraded and who will be exalted? And after the end of that litany of all the possibilities, the congregation says out loud, Utshuva, Utfila, Utstaka, Maviroin et roa hagzera, but teshuva, repentance, tefila, prayer, tzedakah, charity, righteousness. Maviroin et roa hagzera, various ways to translate that. He, in this one, it says, remove the evil of the decree or lessen the evil of the decree or cause the evil decree to pass away. Uh, the point being, though, even though we have this above, we still have the opportunity to repent, to have the opportunity to uh, ask God to forgive us. And this is repeated on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as well. And so we say, for your name signifies your praise, hard to anger and easy to appease. If you do not wish the death of one deserving death, but he repent from his way and live. Until the day of his death, you await him. If he repents, you will accept him immediately. It is true that you are their creator and you know their inclination for their flesh and blood. A man's origin is from dust and his destiny is back to dust. At risk of his life, he earns his bread. He is likened to a broken shard, withering grass, a fading flower, a passing shade, a dissipating cloud, a blowing wind, flying dust, and a fleeting dream. But you are the king, the living and enduring God. And this idea also, the comparison between human beings as being fleeting, of more mortal, of, is compared with God. We have that one of the Piyotim in which we talk about God Elyon, Melech Elyon, Most High God. Uh, and uh, that is then compared with uh, earthly God, uh, not earthly God, earthly kings. You know, God's, makes, with God's word is, is eternal and earthly civil uh, kings they change their mind, they do different things, they get angry, they get happy, whatever it may be. And so you can never rely 100% on the earthly king, but you can rely upon uh, God. Now, during the course of many of these piyotim, uh, the ark will be opened. When a piyot is said to be especially important, uh, part especially important or, or to emphasize its importance, the ark is opened. Uh, and everybody rises for that. And there's a lot of up and down on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur services, that were, therefore. Right. Now, Rosh Hashanah uh, continues, of course, throughout the, uh, through the next day. We repeat a lot of these things, especially if it's a weekday, both day or weekdays, like there will be this year. The two days are very similar. Uh, there's certain aspects of Rosh Hashanah that are special to it. It's considered in some ways like one long day rather than being two separate days. It's considered to be one long day and that affects certain things. Um, so that, for example, the second night of Rosh Hashanah, uh, we say the Shechayanu again. But normally, but because it's regarded as one long day, there's a question whether or not we should say Shechayanu the second night. So there's a custom to have something new at your table for the second night's dinner. Uh, a new fruit that you haven't had this season, uh, new clothing, if you want to have something new and have Shechiano for uh, getting a new dress, a new, new suit or whatever, uh, to recite it. Uh, and uh, that's you know, the, the basically the things that are involved with it. Traditionally, we, risk, we wish everybody Shana Tova, 
Shonatova Tikatevu, may you be inscribed for a good year. And Shonatova, just Shonatova, Happy New Year, also all those things. All right. Now, from Rosh Hashanah through to Yom Kippur are known as Aseret Yimei Teshuvah, the 10 days of repentance. Uh, and there are extra prayers that are added to the service every day, short prayers that are added, uh, uh, certain other elements that uh, are part and parcel of it. But one of the important things is that uh, we're going to recite several times during the course of the uh, Yom Kippur service, and actually even starting in Mincha before Yom Kippur, what is known as the Vidui. Vidui is the confessional. The confessional, you know, we're, we're told that we should confess the day before we die. Anybody out there know what day you're going to die? Not me, I wouldn't want to know that information. Uh, so you have to confess every day. You have to repent every day because you never know if it's going to be your last day. So even on, uh, so the tradition was that on Yom Kippur, uh, the last meal that we eat before uh, the, uh, the Yom Kippur fast begins, uh, there was a tradition to make sure you said the Mincha service early. And at the Mincha service, you would recite the confessional, the Vidu, just in case maybe you choke on a fish bone during dinner and die before Yom Kippur. And you wouldn't have done your uh, teshuva, done your atonement. Uh, I'm going to come back to those in a minute. I just I want to touch upon uh, most synagogues will happen is they'll have a Mincha, you'll, you'll eat at home, finish as close to sundown or when the start of the service is going to be at the synagogue. Uh, some synagogues do have a mincha service at that time, others do not. Uh, but the first, uh, once the sun is set, you are now no longer allowed to uh, eat or drink. Indeed, there's five afflictions that we're supposed to do to ourselves. We're not supposed to eat or drink. We're not supposed to wear leather shoes. We're not supposed to take showers, bathe. We're not allowed to, to anoint our bodies, put oils and things on them. And we're not supposed to have sexual relations. So those five inuim are for the 25 hours that really Yom Kippur consists of, because you start before sunset, then you finish it after sunset. Um, and so before the sun sets, you have to have been finished eating and doing all these other things. Um, this, in the synagogue, uh, three uh, at least two Sefer Torah are taken out from the ark. Sometimes all of them, the people are honored with carrying them, hold them next to the chazan, the person who's chanting the service. And then we recite what is called Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre, again, is a very powerful sounding prayer, mostly because of the tune in, in, in Ashkenazic circles. Uh, I will butcher it a little bit, but it sounds like this. What this really is a listing of various terms that mean making oaths and promises. We're told we should really never make a promise because you never know if you're going to be able to live up to it. And if you make the promise, be sure that you fulfill it. But people often are unable to fulfill their promises. And so there arose the tradition of reciting uh, on Yom Kippur, the Kol Nidre, in which we ask God to release us from any promises that we made to him, not to, other, not to people but things that we promised God, I will be better this year, I will do this, I will do that. Uh, and that is the nature of the Kol Nidre. It's really a very legalistic, very dry uh, ceremony, but it's become so caught up because of the sound of the music and the ushering in of Yom Kippur that it has caught the imagination and many people uh, 
will rush to be sure that you did the synagogue in time for Kol Nidre, even if they normally would come to synagogue a little bit later. Okay. Now, I also mentioned that we, throughout uh, Yom Kippur, we recite the uh, Vidoy, the confessional. We do it at Mincha time, and we do it again that evening of Yom Kippur. Um, and uh, it is in Hebrew, in Hebrew we say it, Ashanu, Bagadnu, Gazanu, Dibanu, Dofi. Uh, for those of you who have learned a little Hebrew, you will note that the first word here begins with Aleph, the next word with Bet, whoops, then Gimel, then Dalid. It's A, B, C, D in Hebrew. And one of the things, uh, I think I mentioned this a little bit last week also, is that, you know, how do you translate these kinds of prayers? So this is a very traditional translation um, with the, some of the things added just to help us understand. We have trespassed, we have betrayed, we have stolen, we have slandered, we have caused others to sin, we have caused others to commit sins for which they are called wicked. We have sinned with malicious intent. We have forcibly taken others' possessions, even though we paid for them, and you know, we forced them to sell it. Uh, you know, uh, we have added falsehood upon falsehood. We have joined with evil individuals or groups. We have given harmful advice. We have deceived. We have mocked. We have rebelled against God and his Torah. We have caused God to be angry with us. We have turned away from God's Torah. We have sinned deliberately. We have been negligent in our performance of the commandments. We have caused our friends grief. We have been stiff-necked, refusing to admit that our suffering is caused by our own sins. For we have committed sins for which we are called Russia. We have committed sins which are the result of moral corruption. We committed sins which the Torah refers to as abominations. We have gone astray. We have led others astray. And traditionally, what we do is that we recite each one of these Averot. We strike our chest and we take a right hand and hit over our heart. Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, the Banu Dofi. As a, a symbolic beating of ourself, although a famous Hasidic saying statement was better than you should beat your heart, your heart should be beating you. And you should feel it in your heart, uh, not just symbolize it by striking your heart with your hands. Now I mentioned uh, that uh, Rabbi Jules Harlow when he, uh, a number of years ago, boy, this is over 50 years now, um, uh, yeah, around 50 years ago, uh, when they, the rabbinical assembly put out uh, a new machzer, he decided instead of translating directly, he would try to capture the meaning of the ashamnu. And the meaning of ashamnu is we did every sin from Aleph to Tav, A to Z, Alpha to Omega. So what he did was instead of translating, he transferred it to an alphabetical acrostic in English. We abuse, we betray, we are cruel, we destroy, we embitter, we falsify, we gossip, we hate, we insult, we jeer, we kill, we lie, we mock, we neglect, we oppress, we pervert, we quarrel, we rebel, we steal, we transgress, we are unkind, we are violent, we are wicked, we are xenophobic, we yield to evil, we are zealous for bad causes. I had a hard time finding an X. Uh, and I, I think in later versions of it, they came up with something else for the X because people didn't know what xenophobic meant. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, but that captures what the feel of it is rather than the translation. Right. Now, following that, we then have a, a series, again, using the alphabet, uh, but it's a little different way this time. We say, for the sin we committed before you under compulsion and willingly, for the sin we committed before you by callously hardening the heart. By the way, this, what I have on here, I took offline in the, in, in the uh, I'm going to send this to you, but in the italics is the interpretation from the Sidur Hagra, the Sidur of the Vilna Ga'om, which talks about each uh, or most of these uh, sins. The sin we committed before you with utterance of the lips, openly and secretly, in sexual morality, 
through misuse of our speech, with knowledge and deceit, improper thoughts, cheating our fellow man, uh, with verbal confession, by joining in lewd gathering, uh, for the say, uh, for sin we committed you before you intentionally and unintentionally, uh, bef uh, by insufficient respect for parents and teachers, uh, by using coercion to harm others, by desecrating the divine name, by foolish talk, by impurity of lips, evil inclination, unknowingly and unknowingly, in all kulamila, for all of these, God of pardon, pardon us, forgive us, grant us atonement. Now, I just had the first uh, uh, bit of this. Uh, it goes through the entire alphabet, uh, twice for each letter of the alphabet uh, before it finishes. So, now, Yom Kippur. We begin it before sunset in the evening. It goes till after sunset the next day. So um, during that, I says about 25 hours. Some uh, over the course of the centuries, many PO team were, were created. The Musaf has some very powerful passages in it. Uh, one of them talks about the martyrdom of, of the rabbis, of, of certain rabbis who were persecuted by the Romans on the Hadrianic persecutions. Uh, and uh, uh, a description of the service that took place on Yom Kippur, a very difficult poetic rendition in, uh, of, that describes the entire day's service in the ancient temple. Uh, in some of the conservative uh, new Mahsarim, they have substituted a, a, a variant on that, which uses the Mishnaic Hebrew which is a little bit easier for most people to understand uh, describing the day. Some, you know, depending on the synagogue, depending on what time the service starts, how late sunset is, people can be in the synagogue nearly all day long or all day long. Uh, and uh, we have uh, on every day of the week, we have at sunset, we have the evening service. In the morning, we have the morning service, Tefillot uh, Shachar, uh, And in the afternoon, we have Tefillot Mincha. On Shabbat and Yom Tov, on the Sabbath and on a holiday, we add uh, Musaf. The Musaf service, we talk, I talked about that on Rosh Hashanah, describing that in more, little more detail for Rosh Hashanah. Then uh, Mincha in the afternoon of Yom Kippur, what is different is that on, at the end of Yom Kippur, towards nightfall, just as is towards the setting of the sun, we have a service which is called Ni'ila. Ni'ila means the locking or the closing of the gates. One interpretation is that it meant the closing of the gates of the temple in Jerusalem, a very concrete closing of the gates. Another interpretation is it's a reference to the closing of the gates in heaven above that uh, God, uh, the, the, the gate of prayer to heaven is about to close. And so we want, for the last time, we want to get in uh, our prayers to God. Again, remember, I said, you know, I see this metaphorically. Some people take it more uh, in, in a real sense. And, and let's run with the metaphor as if it were real. This is our last chance to beg for our lives before God. And the prayers there slightly change part of the, the, the wording. Uh, we've up until now we have asked God to inscribe us in the book of life. In, uh, 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 now at Ni'ila, when the day's about to end, we ask God to seal us in the book of life. Not Katvenu. But Chotmenu, yes? Was that somebody or me just echoing? This is me echoing. Okay. Um, when, uh, and at the end of the service, uh, we have Havdalah, just like because Shabbat and Yom Kippur share the same kind of sanctity uh, about working and fires and everything like that, because there's no cooking and eating on Yom Kippur. 
Uh, and then there is a special ceremony in which we uh, say the Shema, uh, recognize God as, as the one, one true God, Adonai Hua Elohim, and then we sound a shofar one last time, Tikagadola, to mark the end of the day. And then uh, some synagogues do this and then go into the evening service, Aravit. Uh, others, because people have a tendency to rush out because everybody hasn't eaten for so long, God forbid they should miss dinner too much, uh, you know, they have to hurry home and get something to eat. Uh, but the tradition was to do that really before Mariv. Most conservative synagogues today do it after Mariv. So as soon as Yom Kippur is over, it's already time to start getting ready for Sukkot. I always, you know, uh, when I have my opportunity to, if I get to ask the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the Holy One, praise be any questions in the world to come, I'm going to have to ask him, why couldn't you spread them out a little bit? Especially for the, those who spend a lot of time cooking and baking and everything. All right. Now the holiday of Sukkot uh, gets its name from the fact that it says in the Torah, uh, starting in the night of the 14th, uh, Shivat Yamim, you shall live in booths for seven days. We're supposed to make a booth, a temporary kind of habitation that becomes our home on Sukkot. Uh, these are some uh, pictures taken off of uh, the world famous Google search. Uh, which is you know, available to us today uh, of a Sukkot. This is a, this is very similar in setup to the way it's described as being in the Talmud. In other words, there were three walls and one side was open. You have a roof that is a temporary kind of roof of wood, slates or, or, or uh, branches, bamboo, all of those things are possible. And you decorate it and you're supposed to live as much as possible in the Sukkot. In Israel, where the weather is usually fairly decent at this time of year, and actually this year Sukkot falls early enough and they uh, might be decent weather to be in the Sukkot all the time. Many, many people eat, sleep, do everything they can in the Sukkot. Okay. Uh, but at least your meals are supposed to be eaten in the sukkah. If you don't have your own sukkah, many synagogues have one so that you can le at least fulfill the basic mitzvah of having something to eat in the sukkah. On the first night of Sukkot, uh, we light the candles in the sukkah. We make the kiddush in the sukkah. Uh, there's an additional blessing uh, that we make uh, after we uh, make the kiddush. We also say a blessing for the act of, of sitting in the sukkah, li living in the sukkah. Sher kiddushah mitzvotah v'tzivanu leshev ba sukkah. Who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to dwell, to live, to sit in the sukkah. And the first two nights again, we say shechiyanu. First night shechiyanu is at the end. The second night shechiyanu comes before leshev ba sukkah. Okay? And then you have our meal there. Now, Rabbi, what happens if it rains? The Talmud says if it rains, you have to wait hours until it's, it's clear that it's not going to let up, and then you can do it in the house. But ideally, at least the motz, the the beer, the uh, kiddush, and the hamotzi should be in the sukkah. My first pulpit was in Sioux City, Iowa. Sioux City, Iowa is in the middle of nowhere. It's the very end of Iowa. It's the middle of of America. Uh, it's sort of Winnipeg a little bit south. And so Sukkot, we had, we had snow in our Sukkot from time to time. Uh, and we'd bundle up, it was much younger than we were bundle up and going. Obviously, when the weather is really nasty, people can't uh, already in, in, in Europe, in the Middle Ages, they said that because of the cold weather, you didn't necessarily have to sleep in the Sukkot, but to, you, to use it as much as possible, uh, weather being uh, bearable. And Talmud actually says, if it gets too hot in the sukkah, you're li allowed to go inside to get in the shade from your house. Uh, no, but, uh, and I really experienced that when I was in suit and uh, my second pulpit was in El Paso, Texas, high desert country. 
And uh, we, we got so hot one time in the sukkah, we had to go in the house into the air conditioning. What makes a sukkah? The sukkah has to have three walls. Uh, they can be made out of anything, really. And actually have to have two full walls and at least a part of the third. The cover has to be made of something that is gro grows from the earth wood, branches, that sort of thing. You cannot use metal to make the actual roofing. You can use it for framing, but you can't use it to make the roofing. The rule is you have to have more shade than sunlight. When you put on the roof, it has to be enough roofing that when the sun shines down through it, there's more shade on the ground than there is sunlight. But you shouldn't have so much on it that it would uh, stop the rain from falling through. If you had to, you could put something on top during when it's, if it's raining to uh, protect the sukkah, and when the rain stops, take that cover off, uh, because you can't say the blessing if there's a cover on the sukkah. Now, in some places, they don't have any place on the ground to do it, but they've got a nice balcony. I don't know where that was taken. I, uh, it doesn't look like Israel, but that, here you have a sukkah that somebody put on their balcony. You can see the guy's studying Talmud, I think, right there. And in Israel, one way to know if it was designed to be a religious neighborhood was that the uh, a mere pesset, a porch, is like uh, a balcony is de rigueur in Israeli homes. So what they do is they stagger the uh, balconies, the, the mere pasal, the, the porches, so that there's at least some open air above each sukkah, so nothing overhangs it. So you've got a clear uh, way up to the sky because you can't build a sukkah under an overhang. And so if you want to know if a neighborhood in Israel was built to be for uh, religious Jews or it's built just in generally, uh, if you look at the mere pasal, the, the balconies, that will tell you if it was designed for a religious neighborhood. Israel something, it has a lot of that. Now, so beginning the first day of Sukkot, till the end of Sukkot, we are supposed to dwell in the Sukkah, I have our meals there. Uh, kiddush is a special Kiddush uh, for Sukkot, for the holidays. It's very similar to the Kiddush for Rosh Hashanah and for Sukkot and, and uh, excuse me, Pesach and Shavuot, and even similar to the Shabbat one as well. And the synagogue services are like the Shabbat services. We have some additions. One of the additions being we recite special uh, psalms uh, that are called Hallel, uh, section of the Book of Psalms that praise God. Uh, and one of the, the word Hallel in Hebrew is Hallel. The word, English word Hallelujah is just a transliteration of Hallel Yud Hey, Yah, means praise the Lord, praise God. And so in Hallel, we praise God. But also associated with uh, Sukkot and with the recitation of Hallel is it says in the Torah that on the holiday we're supposed to take eight Prihadar. Uh, uh, and uh, the four elements, uh, four species as they're called uh, for the holiday. Here, this is not a big lemon. This is in Hebrew an etrog. In English, English it's a citron. I have no idea if anybody uses it for anything in the world except for Jews using it on Sukkot. Before Sukkot, if you have a nice yellow color and a nice elongated shape and no holes anywhere and no brown spots, and this little piece here, which is called the pitum, is, is whole, that's where the flower was when it grew on the tree, and this is the stem. If you have all of these things together, and it's a nice size and all of that, you can spend lots of money buying it. Really, in today, well, in Israel, you go uh, into the marketplace and you'll have a booth 
uh, a table that's set up, they just sell the etrogan. Another table, they sell the lula. Another, they say they sell the myrtle. Another, they sell, sell the willow. Here, usually what happens, you go to, you order it, you go to the books, Jewish bookstore and you get it all together. And so they charge you one price for the whole kit and caboodle. But uh, in Israel, you can buy them separately. Here, you will start off prices probably about $65, $70 for a set. Uh, the place I go to, I think the highest they ever go is 150. But you can go up to 200 and more. In some places, it's kind of fun to go to one of these places where there are a lot of Jews who are very, very strict in their observance. You'll sometimes see them with the, the glasses they use for checking out jewelry to make sure that there's no blemish whatsoever on the etro. I have a question. Sure. Let's say you are um, someone who just can't afford to spend $150 extra for these things. What do you do? All right. A lot of synagogues buy extra sets for the congregants. And so when you go to the synagogue to, to pray, you can use the, the synagogue's etrog and lulav uh, for the ceremonial. Uh, it must belong to you. This is one of the things. The Talmud says it has to belong to you. So the deal is, if the synagogue buys it, it's under the assumption that every person who picks it up takes it to own it, and when they put it back down, they give it, they give it up. So during the time of the blessing, it belongs to you. If you borrow somebody's, they can, they can give it to you on the condition that you return it, but they have to give it to you as a gift. Um, you're right, there are a lot of things that cost guilt. Um, if you don't know what guilt, guilt is money. Uh, told you, there's a little Hebrew, a little Yiddish, a little whatever else. Um, and no, it can be, some expenses come up. As I say, there are $50, $65 ones that, that are usable. And, and you know, like the, the rabbis speak of the idea of hidur mitzvah. You try to do the thing as best as you can. Okay? Uh, but you do what you can do. Okay? And there's a hierarchy of things, but this ideally should be done. And like I say, if you can't afford it, you make arrangements, people buy them, and give them away, give them to each other. There's a story in the Talmud. Matter of fact, the, 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 the section of the Talmud that talks about the holiday of Sukkot, we just finished today, interestingly enough, uh, finished studying on a, on a daily basis. And it tells the story of several important rabbis who are, for some reason, they went on a ship during the holiday time. And the, the elder, the most important one, Rabbi Gamliel, bought a little of an etrog for a huge sum of money. And then each one of the other rabbis, he, they gave it in turn to the next guy down the line until they reached Rabbi Akiva, who was the least of them. And then he gave it back to Robin Gamliel. So that everybody owned it at the time of the uh, waving of the little of an etrog. So we have the lulav is a palm branch from a date palm. That's before it opens up. Uh, the myrtle, the myrtle should have three leaves coming from the same point on the branch. The willows, there are special certain willows that are kosher for the holiday. Uh, my son, uh, a few years ago, rooted one. And now we have our own willow tree that we take for Sukkot every year in my yard. All right, now, what, what do you do? So in the morning or just before Hallel, different customs, we won't go into it now. One takes, a, it should be set up like this. This is the spine, this is back towards you. The tradition is <coughs> before you pick it up, you make sure that the etrog is upside down. The etrog grows on the tree instead of hanging down, the etrog actually grows up. The etrog trees, not only do the etrog grow up and you're not know, flop down, they may, may on the, be on the tree for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, so the, all the other elements, they are going up the way they grow. This is made out of leaves from a, 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 a palm tree. 
uh, so that they're all bound together. So we take the etrog in the right hand and the lulav in the left. The etrog is facing down. We say the bracha, on the taking of the lulav. We turn the etrog up. And then traditionally what we do is we have to wave it three times in front of us. If we're looking at the arc in the center, three times east, three times south, three times west, three, yeah, three times <laughs> north, two times, three times up and three times down. You get the four directions and the up and the down. Uh, it's very clear the idea that it's asking God's blessings on all the part of the world. That's the, tr the traditional Ashkenazic way of doing it. There are the other variations on it as well. Uh, and then during the Hallel, at certain times, we wave the Lulav again. Uh, then normally what happens is uh, we, we put the Lulav and Etrog down, we have the Torah reading, uh, we uh, then come to the Hallel, we pick up the Lulav and an Etrog, and we do uh, the waving of the Lulav and Etrog, put it down, we have the Torah reading, the Haftarah, we have the Musaf service, and then after Musaf, we have what is called Hoshanas. Uh, we circle the synagogue, at least with a central arc and uh, a central table, reader's table in the middle, which is uh, symbolic of what took place in the temple in Jerusalem. And as we go around, we recite a, a special hymn and has the refrain, Hoshana, save us. Now, one interesting fact for those of you who uh, remember your New Testament story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and we're told that the people there waved palm branches and said, Hoshana, or Hosanna. And this is another picture of it. Um, and one of the questions that is asked is, what has this got to do with Passover? According to the New Testament, according to the Gospels, he comes to Jerusalem just before Pesach, Passover. But all those are elements of what takes place on Sukkot. So I leave that to other minds to figure out why they have elements of Sukkot being mentioned in the New Testament around the time of Passover. I have another question. Sure. Can you eat the um, etro? etro? etro After yeah. the holiday is completely over, you can eat the etro if you really want to. It's not very tasty. Some mm. people do make a netro jam with lots of uh, or marmalade with lots of sugar. I don't think okay. you'd want, I don't think you really would want to eat it. But the, the Talmud talks about people eating them. Is it bitter or is it like? Very, it's very bitter. It's very bitter. It's not very tasty. There's not a lot of flesh inside either. Ah, uh, I see. Okay, I was curious. Right. Well, you you have to have a net find a netro after Sukkot. I tell you, they're very cheap after Sukkot. <laughs> not even a dime a dozen. <laughs> But now what's interesting, getting back to the, the story about Jesus, the lulav and the etrog were very important symbols in ancient Israel. And indeed they appear on some coins. Uh, this is a coin, uh, maybe a little bit smaller. All right. Uh, Actually, this was done during the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was around the year 135 of the coming year after the temple was destroyed. And Bar Kokhba was trying to uh, uh, reference back to ancient Israel. And so the Hebrew lettering is the old style Hebrew lettering. But on it, you can see there's this is the lulav, and this is the myrtle, and this is the willow. And I think this is supposed to be the etrog down here. And here is a picture of a synagogue floor mosaic. You have the menorah from the temple. You have a shofar. And you have the lulav. Uh, here we have other examples of coins where, again, uh, th this is the temple. And this is the lulav and etrog bound together. 
part of that, and that may be reflected in the story in the New Testament. We know, that, and we'll talk about it again when we get to Hanukkah. The year uh, that uh, the temple was under the Greek and, and Hellenizing Jews rule, uh, they could not celebrate Sukkot that year. And according to uh, the Book of Maccabees, they celebrated Sukkot when they rededicated the temple on the 25th of Kislev, which is when we celebrate Hanukkah. And so uh, th that's part of the rationale why they suggest it's eight days for Hanukkah, uh, but we'll talk about it more then, but it becomes a symbol of, of, of Israelite freedom, Jew Judean freedom. And that's why the Lulav and Etrog are uh, so important in that uh, those pictures. It also may be reflecting the idea that if Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah, the Messiah was supposed to free the Jews from Roman rule, and therefore it would be appropriate for to be saluted with a lulav and etrog, or at least with the lulav. Now, uh, one more bit, and we'll be finished for the night. Um, the, the Torah says that we have Sukkot for seven days, and then Yom Shmini Atzeret, then comes the eighth day of assembly. So Sukkot is the first seven days. The eighth day is actually a totally separate holiday called Shmini Atzeret, eighth day of assembly. And uh, it, the liturgy reflects that. It, we don't wave lulav and etrog. There are differences of opinion about sitting in the sukkah, but certain, uh, many sit in the sukkah, but without a blessing on Shmini Atzeret. Uh, but it doesn't have the, the special symbols that the others have. However, what we do have is the following. Outside of Israel, since we have two days of a holiday, on the first day of Shmini Atzeret, we recite the Yisker prayers. Yisker prayers for the dead, memorial prayers for our loved ones. It's recited on Yom Kippur. It's also recited on one of the days of the three holidays. So on the first day of Shemini Atzeret, one of the major parts of the service is the uh, reciting of Yisker, a member of the dead. The second day of Shemini Atzeret, became known as Simchat Torah. Became known as Simchat Torah because there was a tradition that is still maintained today that we read the Torah in a cycle. And in the fall of the year, right after Shmini Atzeret, the first Shabbat after Shmini Atzeret, we begin reading the Torah with the account of creation, Genesis 1.1. Then each uh, day, each Shabbat rather, we read several more chapters. So that by the time we get to Simchat Torah, we are fi we're finishing the reading of the book of Deuteronomy and we're ready to start the Torah all over again. So what happens is in the evening, we take Torah scrolls out and we dance around the synagogue, just like we had on Sukkot and the intermediate days circling the synagogue. Uh, on the Hoshana Rabbah, which is the last day of straightforward Sukkot, we do that eight times and uh, seven times rather. And there's a whole nother ceremony goes with it. I, I skipped over that. On uh, Simchat Torah, we dance with the Torahs, we circle the synagogue. Uh, we read a little bit, which is unusual from the synagogue in the Torah that night. The next day, once again, we take the Torah scrolls out of the ark, we march around the synagogue, we sing, we dance, we celebrate God's Torah. Uh, a few hours later, after that's been going on for a while, uh, three Torah scrolls are left out. One Torah scroll is rolled to the end of Deuteronomy. One is rolled to the beginning of Genesis, and one is rolled to the part of the Torah that talks about uh, the holiday of Shemini Atzeret. The normal tradition is that uh, everyone in the synagogue, depending upon the nature of the synagogue, if it's a more traditional, only the men, if it's a, or women have Aliyah to women too as well, are called up to the Torah, 
and we go through the Torah reading several times till everybody in the synagogue who wants has had an aliyah to the Torah. All right. Then the, uh, we take uh, and finish the last passages of Deuteronomy. That's a special honor given to a person who is called uh, Chatan Torah, the groom of the Torah. Again, this is all masculine that was in the traditional synagogues that's how it was done. Somebody you wanted to honor. And then the second Torah, which is already rolled to Genesis, is taken uh, up to the table. And another person is honored with a chatan, a chatan Bereshit, the, uh, literally the groom of Bereshit, of Genesis. And then uh, the opening chapter and the beginning of the second chapter, the seven days of creation, are read in the synagogue. Uh, and then we have the Mafter, Aliyah, the Mafter portion, which, as I said, talks about the holiday. For the reading from the prophets, what was chosen by the rabbis is the opening chapter of the book of Joshua. Because the book of Joshua is the next book in the Bible that follows the Torah. So in a way, what we're saying is, one, we never stop reading the Torah. As soon as we finish it, we start over again. Torah is always at the center of our life. Furthermore, not only is the Torah important, but the rest of the Tanakh, the rest of the Bible is important. And it's connected to the Torah, as we see with uh, the, the reading from uh, the uh, book of Joshua. Okay. And then finally, that night, it's all over and done with. And uh, we pack up our bags from, this, uh, from all the holidays until, until Hanukkah. Okay? Oh, my wife wants to introduce herself. <laughs> that, Hi. That's her dog. All right, so now because of the holidays, we're not going to get together until October. I think that's when it is the next meet sessions in October. But I gave you some readings to help go over. Uh, for what, what the holidays help give you some backing on there. I will send out what I did tonight with you as well. Uh, and of course, anybody's questions or anything can always give me an email, a buzz, whatever the case may be. Talk to your sponsoring rabbi, etc. Okay, anything anybody out there's got? Yes, no? Okay, we'll say good night. Um, oh, sorry, uh, I was gonna ask really, yeah. really quickly. Um, is there yes. any chance that in after November, or it's after October when we come back, we'll be meeting in person because I know a lot of the synagogues are starting to start in person services. I don't know. I haven't got an answer for you. Um, I guess a lot depends what happens here. Now. Uh, the, the synagogues, most of the synagogues are being very careful about what they're doing. Uh, but I have been told that if everything else is, is okay, then we will start meeting in person at the synagogue. In which case, I'm going to see if I can find some way of recording it. Uh, I like to walk around, so that's going to be hard for me to figure that out. But I hold me down. <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to her. <laughs> yeah. um, but I will still try. Uh, if I can do something like that, I will try to record it on my uh, tablet. And, and uh, maybe that'll work that way. Okay. For those I have another today. question. You said October is when we're gonna have the next meeting. Like what what Wednesday? What's Wednesday? Which Wednesday? Sorry. Well, let me see. Where's the calendar? Wow. Yeah. It's, it's October 9th. Wait. Okay. Oh, it's on the calendar already. Yeah, everything's yeah. the whole year's on the calendar. I don't I don't know uh, where anything's about the calendar. Okay, I see, I see. All so right. any if, if I know for if look right now, assume we're going to be on Zoom. If I hear otherwise, I will certainly let you know. And if you have some issues with it, as I say, I'm going to try and record them, talk to your rabbi, and things like that. We'll work it all out. Okay. Anything else? Is it so, there are too many small faces. I can't see her. Okay. Good night, everybody.